Hey folks, Carolyn here to tell you just a little bit about the Games and Online Harassment Hotline. It's a free text message based confidential emotional support hotline that was created specifically for the gaming community. So whether you're a player, a developer, a streamer, a competitor, any part of the gaming community, the hotline is here for you, ready to provide emotional support or help finding the referrals and resources that you may need. Visit gameshotline.org for more information. It is trying to do something really interesting. I don't know that I always, you know, followed along with what was going on, but I did find it it made those moments more startling when we are, you know, suddenly thrown into the world of color. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined today by two women who've been workshopping a new regional production, Carolyn Pettit. It is so painful. It is such a painful <laughs> process. <laughs> and Ebony Adams. I'm really excited to have Carolyn as the director. Oh, of no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, does that mean, Ebony, you have an accent that nobody else in the <laughs> show has? Yep, yep. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Carolyn, do you want to be the um, the director in this scenario, or would you prefer to be the gentrifier? Who I'll be the, like, <laughs> the, the, white, soy the, milk. White, the white actor who's like, oh, I totally get why she talks that way. <laughs> Yeah. That was so painful. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, bet you do. I bet you do. <laughs> uh, oh my God. This week, we're wrapping up our month long special spotlight on black cinema with the 40 year old version. Stay tuned. And we will never talk about black cinema again. Again. <laughs> As I wrote that sentence, I wanted to follow it up with, like, obviously, this is not going to be the last time we talk about a black no, film on here. But then I remembered Anita being um, scared that people that it would we would give the impression that we were doing that gross thing where people just focus on black media during Black History Month. And I'm like, let me go ahead and set this up and see what Anita says. I didn't even want to do spotlight on black media this month just out of protest which sounds like such a terrible thing to say it is it I is know, listen but i'm glad i'm glad we did it um we're not actually gonna be we, our break is during women's history month so fuck women <laughs> whatever <Yeah>. mm-hmm. <laughs> it's fine um yeah no i actually really liked um i liked this process uh, and like being able to there was a bunch of these movies that I had been wanting to watch and didn't. So I was excited about doing that. And I like sort of theming. I just, you know, I think people should be really mindful of how like the reality of how gross it is when like yeah. organizations and companies are really do only highlight and spotlight black folks I mean, during February, you know? I mean, it's an yeah, interesting of course. parallel in a way with some of, with some of the stuff that happens in this film with this idea of like, there can be, there's the danger of, putting blackness in a box where we're comfortable with it. And, th- and therefore like once, and that's the only, you know, we, we just, we, we set the boundaries of the box and therefore like it's safe and it's comforting to us. And that's the only way we want it. And we don't have to deal with it otherwise. Like that's the danger of like, well, February is black history month. We'll do our focus here. And then like, that's it. You know, that's like the bound, the limits of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, as the black co-host of Feminist yeah. Frequency Radio, let's hear from you, Ebony. <laughs> Ebony, what do my, you have? <laughs> Ask my reflection to this is yes, of course, there's that danger, but you know, if you know us and know the show at all, right. you know that you know this obviously is not the only time we're going to be focusing on this, but there is a benefit, and I mean, yeah, we can absolutely unpack like the dangers of like you know white society being able to package you know otherness and difference into convenient boxes and convenient places but there is something special about like forcing an audience to like wrestle with something and saying you cannot look away if you're going to consume what we do during this month this is what we're focusing on you can choose to take this journey with us or not but this is what we're going to be focusing on and you know um the whole point of these shows is to say oh like there's so many other amazing things that we can be checking out here are four wonderful ones but if this has inspired you moved you infuriated you Mm -hmm. if it's causing you to freak out in any way (laughs) then like you know hey let's 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 expand the boundaries of this month but i think we chose like some great films 
um, that really I speak mean, to each other in an interesting way. You curated this list, so you, yeah. But I mean, y'all had to really agree. You know, it wasn't as if you know I said, oh, let's you know let's talk about these, and you know y'all didn't think about it. You know, if you had been really against watching like Judas and the Black Messiah or daughters of the dust we would have talked about it and done something else you know like there was there was agreement there and i think it all listen i'm just trying you to don't give you take, credit no i'm <laughs> saying i'm speaking to the credit. audience now i'm saying to the audience right now we are doing this shit we got one more of these special episodes and yeah take this journey with us my friends yeah all right yeah. let me introduce the movie and then um we can we can get back into, into it the, yeah because i think that um the conversation naturally flows into that. So let's yeah. let, let me just interrupt it really quickly. Cool. All yeah. right. Winner of the 2020 U.S. Dramatic Competition Directing Prize at Sundance, the 40-year-old version was written, directed, and produced by Rada Blank. In her feature, Derek Directorial <laughs> Debut. Oh, boy. That's a, that's a tough one right there. Mm-hmm. The film is loosely based on Blank's own life and is sharp, timely and often hilarious. The film finds the writer performer growing increasingly frustrated with her lack of success as a playwright and her job teaching a group of wild teenagers. So she decides to become a rapper along the way. She must wrestle with her identity as a black creative in a world full of white gatekeepers and a black woman wondering what turning 40 even means if it means anything. It's a fantastic film that vividly captures the beat life and vitality of the Harlem through which Rada moves. And it's packed with performances and characters that jump off the screen. Can we talk about Lamont, the <laughs> Greek chorus <laughs> represented by Lamont, the homeless guy who lives outside Rada's building? Far and away, my favorite character, but out of so many great characters in this movie, you know? But wow, this script <clears throat> is fantastic. So fantastic. And, you know, there were, there were times where I was like, I cannot believe this movie got made I, with these people, you know, and I would love for us to talk, you know, at some point, if we have the time about what it actually takes to get a film made, um, because it is so much exponentially harder than you can even imagine to bring something to the screen and then have people see it. But it is 10 million times harder if you're a fat black woman you know, who's not 25, you know, um, in a in a sh- story that doesn't center whiteness in any way, shape or form. Like I was blown away by this film and I was just like, how the fuck did this get made and then and, end up on Netflix? And, and not only that, like uh, like everything you say about her being, you know, 40 and and overweight and black. But but it's specifically a film about how the marketplace of like commercial art, you know, be it theater, you know, obviously it's focused Mm -hmm. on the theater world, um, but we can absolutely extrapolate out like everything, you know, the way that the, um, the Jay Whitman character functions in this film as a producer of plays to like people, producers, you know, people who have money in the film world and what have you, like, this is a film about how, um, it's, it's like pushing back against the ways that artists and particularly like marginalized, you know, artists, obviously specifically in this case, Black artists have to or are, are are often kind of required if they want to have any measure of commercial uh, success to to um, compromise, right, to compromise or, or their their um, their integrity, their ethics, their vision, the kind of art they want to be doing, their voice. And so like that, that to me is what's so remarkable about this is the way that it, it really pushes back against the system, the marketplace as it exists, because, you know, there's almost, I think, this perception at times that like, well, the marketplace of be it theater or film or internet writing or whatever, like it just values good work. It values good writing. (laughs) And like, as long as you do good work, like you will be, you know, your voice will be heard. And that's total bullshit. Like there is so Mm -hmm. much great work that is deemed um, not commercially viable or it's just not you know it's not what the marketplace wants and so it's disregarded it's cast aside and so i i I, like as a person who has worked in creative spaces and who has found myself as a writer compromising my own ethics at times just because you know um integrity doesn't pay the bills always and like sometimes you just have to do a job for hire even if it's like you know there are aspects of it that rub you the wrong way like I, i really appreciated 
how it explored that whole reality and that whole dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the conversation about what kind of blackness um, white supremacy is comfortable acknowledging and in particular, the really, you know, virulent and like self-congratulatory type of white supremacy you get in liberal spaces yeah. like, you know, these, you know, theater elites who like are bending over backwards to produce you know, a Harriet Tubman musical, a Shirley Chisholm musical and Ida B. Wells musical. Like these are precisely the kind of people who think they get it, you know, who think that they are right on mm. in some way, yeah. you know, but they the demand for a certain kind of blackness that is legible to them. You can see how it, it like it viscerally affects Rada to the point where she almost looks like she's sick at certain times, you know? There's that great scene where um, uh, the producer, the white producer is, you know, telling her that he's read, this is near the beginning of the film, he's t read her her play Harlem Ave, um, and <laughs> he's like, you know, there were at times when I just thought, did a black person yes. write this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so many moments where I wanted to like melt off my chair. They were so <laughs> funny. But these are things I have heard this literal line from a white critic of a short story that I wrote, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, at the time that I got that critique, I was in my early 20s. And I thought, this woman is, you know, much older than me. She's been in the literary world forever, you know, and who am I to push back on something? Maybe she is saying something about how I haven't captured, like, my authentic voice. And I just weep for baby Ebony not throat chopping that woman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, and so I wish like the 40 year old version of me, you know, I wish someone would come at me that way uh, right now. But this is real. Like it, as for all the, you know, sort of exaggerated situations that Rada finds herself in, they're not that exaggerated. Yeah. I, I wonder, you know, I <laughs> there the scene where they have um, the, they actually show us this horrifying play oh. um, <laughs> or musical or whatever it is. And the audience, you know, like, it, you know, the black folks are kind of cringing in the audience and the like the young, the older white liberals who are like the theater goers are just like, oh, my God, this is so deep. <laughs> like, I wonder if those people watch this movie and like mm. nod along in agreement or understand mm -hmm. that they are the problem. Like, <laughs> okay. I, I can't imagine that they would ever realize that they're the problem, you know? Oh, no. These people would have voted for Barack Obama a third time if they could have. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, there's something really special about this story, too, in that uh, that it is such a unique uh, a unique experience to being a black woman in this space and mm -hmm. like bringing together the intersections of, um, you know, how she's wh what she's allowed to tell stories about her blackness and, and her community, but also the like the erasure of like older I say older, fuck, she's 40. It's not, right. but like the, what it means to be turning 40 as a woman in this space, right? Mm -hmm. As a, like, you become invisible after a certain point. Who are you even? Like the, the, um, Ebony, in the notes, you wrote the cultural fetish for precocious talent here um, around the like 30 under 30 kind of ideas yeah. where you do something um, and you get some acclaim when you're younger and that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean it like opened doors or allowed you to have this really vibrant career. And I, I that all of that really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the way that the way that experience actually functions, I, I think in a lot of people who have it is actually that it becomes this thing that hangs over you like this. Oh, you you had all this potential and then you didn't fulfill it. Right. Like how. What's wrong with you? Like, why? Why yeah, didn't you go line, on to do great things? Et totally. Cetera? There's a line where she said, where she talks to the producer guy, and he's like, like, you know, I don't remember how he prompted it, but something about like, where you been? She's like, I've been here. Like, I've been around. I don't know what you're fucking talking about. I've been ready to work. You know. Yeah, um, you know, the same industry that will say, like, you know, where are they now? Where have you been? <laughs> will not ask itself, how have we failed to give opportunities uh, to these people that were only useful to us when they were the bright, shiny new things, 
you know, um, as if those two things are completely divorced from each other, as if you can make your own way once you've been placed upon this pedestal as, you know, um, one of the 30 under 30, you know, uh, like as Rada says, like, you know, there's there's where's the 40 under 40, the 50 under 50. It was so interesting that the film opens with this like documentary style talking heads where people are saying like what it means to turn 40. And there's the older woman who we see, you know, pop up occasionally later in the film who's like, listen, that's when, you know, my life started was at 40. You have the Asian shopkeeper who's like, yo, I wouldn't, uh, you know, ever thought you were um, 40 years old. But his appreciation for her at that age is very much tied up in kind of a weird like desire you know, and then the kids <laughs> like, oh, you know, miss, I would never have thought you were 40. I would have thought you were 30 or 35. And I mean, in my mind, I'm like, it's the same thing, you know, <laughs> but to a, to a 17 year old, it might as well be, you know, the difference between here and the moon. Uh, I, it was just hilarious. I remember when I was a, a child, um, it, we like celebrated my mom's 40th birthday and I was like, oh, my God, right. she's so old, old so <laughs> like, old, right? Like, it's just it's it. We, when you're younger, you don't have any conception of it um, in, in in any real way, right? Um, but, I asked but, my mom if she went roller skating with George Washington. That's how <laughs> I understood <laughs> aging. <laughs> and I'm surprised she did not drop me off her roof because the look on her face, like, how old do you think I am? <laughs> once, you're, once you're over age, what, 19 or 20, to a four-year-old, you might as well be a million. Yeah. It's like when you're a kid and you see your teacher out at like the mall or something and you're like, yep. no way. Yep. <laughs> How is that possible that you're also yeah. human? Yeah. Um, they uh, so one thing I just wanted to point out was that like she, like so there's a scene on the bus where she's like, I'm running late and um, a bunch of folks with wheelchairs and like um, I think it was crutches or like a cane mm -hmm. or something. We're trying to get on and. You know, it, like if you've ever been on a bus and and the driver needs to like help folks get on, um, it can take a minute. It that whole thing, I was like, please don't be shitty. Like, yeah. please please don't make this a shitty thing. And it, and it kind of was, but kind of wasn't. Um, but what really bothered me is that in the next scene, she like referred to disabled folks as invalids, and I was like, what? Like, is this going somewhere? Are you using this as a like a teachable moment? And I was just really, I found that. I found that to be very unfortunate. Yeah, for me, I, I I thought it like emphasized how selfish she was, and that the the film seemed conscious to me of the fact that she was being very selfish in that moment. So when she tries to be smooth about asking the bus driver, "Hey, can you just you know let me off here before you let these people on?" You know, in that moment, the film responds and allows the character to respond by being like, "Hey, everybody, this woman you know doesn't want us to you totally. know whatever like calling just, it out." So so yeah, I totally get what you're saying, but. But I was glad that the the bus driver wasn't made to be the problem in mm. that scene because the film could have been like like he could have responded in a way um, that indicated that he thought like she was in the right or whatever. But no, he called her out in that moment. So, I, but I, mean, I get what you're saying. Yeah, there's so there's a, you know in the the following scene there she's working Rada is working with like her teen mm -hmm. you know workshop of um, I guess they're young you know like potential playwrights or, um, you know, they're kind of working, collaborating on some sort of theatrical production. Um, and there's like this argument that happens between two of them where w one of them is named Rosa. And it's at least suggested at one point that Rosa m might be non-binary, like, mm -hmm. because Rada says like, um, you know, like she, or, and then she says like, or, or, sorry, non, you know, non-conforming or what have mm -hmm. you. And then like, Another student in the class says to Ro who's having this beef with Rosa says like, you know, you're still a bitch. Um, and like, you know, and, and I mean, all of that, like, I believed, you know, like, I believed that these characters would talk that way and like they're teens and stuff. So, you know, I, I don't like, I don't know. I mean, it seemed I, to me I, the I, sort of thing that if handled one way, I would be like, wow, that's really fucked up. But because mm -hmm. of the way it's contextualized in this film, I was like, yeah, I mean, OK, like, I mean, I, I get that these are young people who are like feeling out there um, who, you know, whatever, who are not fully well, formed ideologically and so on. And I but yeah, so. but but in that like in that fight, the person you're talking to also refers to the, the other person as a dyke. 
Um, sure. And I get that the teens would do that, but like Rod is an adult here. Yeah. And and like the the word in, like I don't want to keep saying it, but the word right. invalid is not appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And so it was like th- that like that was unnecessary and like someone should have just taken that out because it didn't prove any kind of point. Like the scene, mm-hmm. Ebony, as you described it, I think is super accurate. It's just the language that was used right. later on. I was like this. Why are you doing this? And then Carolyn with her saying the like, you know, sorry, gender nonconforming, whatever. Like I found that to be really dismissive and it wasn't mm. made clear whether um, that the character you're referring to is non-binary or just a lesbian or right. just, you know, like what have you. And so, you know, like, it's not a stain on the movie, but it is like, you know, the little things here and there that I pro- that felt like they didn't serve a purpose other than mm. like, maybe you just don't, you didn't care enough or don't know enough to have not done those things. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do want to suggest that there are, you know, occasional stains and as much as I loved this film and I did love it. Like I laughed out loud many, many times. And I thought it was just really incredibly performed and written, but there are some things that I found troubling about it. And one of them is that scene that you're talking about, Caro, with Elaine's poetry at the beginning, because it's not just how she refers to Rosa, who she calls Brosa in that moment, but also in the body of the poem that she recites and performs. She's talking about like, you know, it's just, oh my God, if you've ever listened that to slam poem. poetry, well, it was, oh, I was, it was precise. It was precisely the kind of stuff where like, this is why I can't go see this stuff. But like this beat <laughs> yeah. poetry, she's doing this like, you know, riff on um, the Zodiac, right? And one of the things she says about a Zodiac, I think it's the Gemini is like, Gemini man, effeminate, you know, how can I be with a man whose ass is fatter than mine is? It's part of a slender, but nevertheless present thread of homophobia in the movie that then also reappears in the rap battle later, which Mm -hmm. I did find really troubling because we never see um, Rada push back against it. So you have these like four amazing, just like fierce female rappers, right? And unfortunately, the way that like, that strength and fierceness is conveyed is through really like homophobic lyrics, you know? And, yeah, I like, and, like I gotta... hyper violent, right? You know, and so I mean, the one that troubled me the most was um, misunderstood. I mean, like these are real rappers out there; these were not just you know performers for the film. But misunderstood, you know, like clearly a lyrical genius. So why does someone like that? have to resort to saying of someone that like, you know, she's GMO created like a watermelon, she male, whatever. I'm like, this, oh, you need to dead this transphobia and homophobia. Like this is not, someone should have been like, hey, can we unpack this shit? Yeah. I also in that scene was thinking about how, um, I don't remember the names of the, the rappers there, but like the, the, the attack on the Muslim rapper was really gross to me to watch. Like just, kind of attacking her for like wearing a scarf and being Muslim and just like, you know, I get it's a battle. Like people are going to talk shit, but you don't need to go there. Like Mm -hmm. you could do other things. And I found that really disturbing. I really liked her relationship with D me too. Mm -hmm. I liked it so much and I found it so sweet. And there's a scene, a scene where they're hooking up and he's like, (laughs) and she's like, that's a young tongue down there. Are you Mm -hmm. beatboxing? (laughs) I was dying. And it was just like, he was so into her and so supportive of her. And it was like, I just found that really, really endearing and sweet. And um, I I liked that modeling of, you know, like he was trying to be vulnerable, but kind of couldn't. And like, you know, but being encouraging and, and, and then, yeah. And like being like taking her to places to show her that she could do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I liked how this film, um, (sighs) I don't want to belabor it and make it seem as if it was some like grand statement on things. But the fact that, yes, we get this 40 year old fat black woman who is clearly seen as an object of desire. Now, yes, we can talk about her, you know, on that phone call with Archie, her agent being like, I'm either going to kill one of these kids or fuck one. And I was like, oh, okay," (laughs) you know, and then I felt a little better when the one student was like, I'm almost 20. But still, teacher, student, don't know, not Mm -hmm. that relationship. Right. But the fact that it's never a question, you know, it's never a question like, oh, Um, you're too old, you're too big, you're too black or whatever. It is understood, you know, that she is someone who has something to offer, who is considered very attractive internally and externally. This is like, this is radical for media, you know? 
in a, in a lesser director's hands, a lesser writer's hands, that absolutely would have been the focus of part of her insecurity. And although there's some jokes about how she's trying to lose weight and everything, it's never like, you know, the B plot of this film that like she feels unlovable because, you know, she's big or she feels like she's never going to have sex again because she's big or whatever. Right. And I just found that so welcome. You know, the film doesn't treat it like um, some sort of ludicrous thing that this young, attractive black man would be into this woman. You know, it's just accepted. Like, of course he would. Rod is the bomb. Yeah. And you're definitely rooting for them, which I mm -hmm. like for sure. Like, uh, while people comment on their relationship, um, it's not the audience is never. Um, um, oh, my God. What is happening to me? The audience, the is pandemic, pandemic brain. Yeah, man, for real. The audience is never encouraged to um, to be dismissive of it. Yeah, and I mean, even though, like, obviously I didn't want her to get with one of her students, I did find it funny how much Rosa was like, yo, Miss V, <laughs> you know, looking good and how protective she was of her. I did think there, it was funny. Yeah, like, the, this film, the the comedy in it is interesting because at first, I like, honestly, like, at first I was like, I don't think this movie is for me, and that's okay. And not in a way that I'm like, it's bad. It's just like, it's not really my thing, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I liked it more as it as we got into it. And I think part of it is that it it drops these little caricatures um, of people like the, the sort of like um, the kind of comedy where it's like really over the top mm -hmm. in between these more tender moments and the over the topness like just doesn't doesn't always work for me. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of rare. And that's just a personal preference in terms of my type of comedy. And so like that that that's obviously a choice that was made and some of it is funny, but I liked the, like the softer, sweeter moments of this. And like that, I thought spoke to me more in terms of like the type, I don't, why can I not talk today? <laughs> Listen, just keep, you know, fumbling towards greatness. We'll get there. I'm so sorry, everybody that this is, I'm just ruining this podcast right now. It is all your fault. Anita. Yeah. Um, can we talk about, like the the way the film actually looks and sounds yeah I, I, I would love to talk about that, that because it was it was really interesting right like the film is primarily in black and white and yet occasionally we will get these brief um inserts of really vivid color and uh this happens when rada is talking about her play harlem ave and then we see like a black box insert of the performers and then it's also when we see like um photos from the past and i just thought it was such an interesting artistic choice like the film is doing something interesting um with itself it's not just a strictly like you know linear narrative um you know feature film it is trying to do something really interesting i don't know that i always you know followed along with what was going along but i did find it you know i was like it made those moments more startling when we are, you know, suddenly thrown into the world of color. And often like, um, you know, because it's old photographs, kind of like fuzzy, blurry, not particularly crisp color, muted, you know, faded. I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, the black and whiteness I thought was interesting um, as a choice for this. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, well, you know, I kept being like, why? And I'm curious how it, it landed for y'all. But I was like, it's almost like she's saying that this is classic. Like, this is a classic tale um, that because it evokes older Hollywood in in the color style, not necessarily in the film style. I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, you know, so because at the very end of the film, um, color seeps, you know, like seeps back into like the final shot of the film, too. Mm -hmm. Right as Rada and B are are kind of walking along and hanging out and stuff. And so, and I didn't, you know, so that choice made me feel like, um, like it was, like Rada had finally liberated herself in some way from the, the, the thing inside of her that was making her feel like she had to compromise herself uh, to, um, you know, like, like for like her life had, was off track and she wasn't like living in full alignment or integrity with herself mm -hmm. as an artist and, uh, or, or what have you. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure. Like that was sort of what that, like, yeah. 
the fact that color seeps in at the end, if that is meaningful in some way, and that color was in those images from the past, like the right. images, then it's it, it seems to suggest that like there's something missing in Rada's life, you know, in the duration of this film that was present maybe in the past, and then maybe is 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 available again in the end after she has, you know, had that really sort of daring, brave moment where she goes on stage and sort of disavows her own play in front of all those the white moneyed liberals who who, you know, made it happen or who applauded it. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like that was that's sort of my take is that is that there's a reason why the world is sort of drained of the full richness of color during the duration of the play. And it has to do with or the film rather, and it has to do with Rada's experience of the world and herself during that time. But I don't know what her, if that was. What. No, I think that 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 definitely makes sense. And it, you know, also um, a allows for an understanding of how Rada is simply trying to keep going after the death of her mother, mm -hmm. um, which is something mm -hmm. that, you know, um, is often like missed in reviews of the film. You know, people talk about like, you know, how she's finding her way as an artist and, you know, coming to terms with like um, what it means for her generation to have been passed by or, you know, whatever, X, Y, and Z. But there is this significant undercurrent that is simply Rada dealing with or not dealing with her grief and loss from the death of her mother. So, you know, we get these voicemail messages from her brother throughout the film you know, encouraging her, you know, demanding of her, begging her to please come, um, you know, see him, go through their mother's things to to finally deal with, you know, the remains of her mother's life. And she, we just see her not dealing with it for, for so long. Um, that rap yeah. when they were, when she's with Dee in the room and he's like mm -hmm. kind of, you know, gently asking her about, her mother and being and being you know to being like you know he says i would give up everything to see my mom for mm -hmm. a second which ebony you've said mm -hmm. several times before um and then they do this like this freestyle rap um around like mama may i and mm -hmm. it was just really touching yeah yeah um, um yep yeah. um so as someone who has spent some time in like um at least at a college level and stuff in like theater, theatrical environments and things like that. I really appreciated or, you know, sort of enjoyed in a, in a morbid kind of way, <laughs> the, the discomfort of a lot of the, the scenes in this film around like theatrical rehearsal and, and workshop mm -hmm. and performance, because like collaborating on plays and stuff can be a wonderfully, um, you know, a wonderful experience of like, communion and 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 with your fellow artists and things like that but it can also be this like extremely awkward you know kind of painful like watching the scenes in this film i was sort of like oh yeah i remember that feeling oh i remember <laughs> that feeling of being in a room like that and like um and uh so and like so there's a scene also a scene where rada um bombs on stage and, yo, and, yo, my God. and yo, yo, I, for me yo, that, yo. <laughs> that scene for me was like a scene from a horror film because yes. my experience my vicarious experience of her you know i mean failure on stage was so intense that like i i was like oh my god no come on i it really yeah. it really twisted me up inside and you knew as soon as she took a hit, yes. you yeah. knew mm -hmm. that that's what was going to happen too. And then watching it, you're like, no, 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 don't no. do that. Oh my god! Especially after she had the win backstage, it was perfect. It was, I know, it was I wonderfully know. written. That scene was so good. Um, and how oh, I was off. Oh, oh, it was so hard to watch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one thing that I thought was a little bit weird, and uh, again, I'm a little out of my lane on this one, but the fact that D asks her, like, are you Muslim or something? Why you always got that thing on your head? Asking why she's wearing a headscarf. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, but a, a lot of black women do, dude. Like, I don't mm -hmm. like, and I, I the, to me, it felt like they needed to prompt and remind the audience about it so that when she takes it off, it's like this liberating kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I, it, that just seemed weird to me. Like, I, I, guess, I get if it was a white dude saying that to her, but. I guess it didn't seem weird to me simply because she's always wearing it. Like, even, you know, in the home, um, you know, she switches it up. Like, it's 
it does seem as if like she never removes it. So it's not simply, you know, an item of fashion, like a stylistic choice. Um, so it, it, yeah. that didn't, that didn't ring, but you know, everybody consumes it. Different. I, I, again, this film, I am so in love with um, this film, Pariah, Daughters of the Dust, <laughs> not Judas and the Black Messiah, because it didn't do this. It was one of my complaints about the film, even though I liked it, but how it evokes place. Like, Seeing a film like this makes me miss New York so much, so much, you know, just like walking down the street, talking to people or not talking to people, you know, um, but the just all of it, the vitality of it, the pace of it, um, it made this this film really evoked so much for me about why you would, you know, spend your life in this environment around these people. You know, um, these kind of opportunities, these kind of like, you know, cultural touchstones, this kind of pattern. Like I, I miss the way New Yorkers talk, you know, the differences between the way people sound in the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens. Like, ah, oh, I just I, I thought that was such like a wonderful evocation of New York in this film. And it's, it is interesting that it's all done in black and white. Right. Because it could have tipped over into pretentiousness very easily, but it, it, it rarely did for me, if ever. You know, um, it just it was something that I came to accept, like pretty quickly once it started. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, um, like Pariah, uh, you know, since you brought up the, the month of films that we viewed, like Pariah remains the pinnacle of a visual, like uh, just the the way it evokes the that the place in which it, it mm -hmm. takes place. It was just so uh, God, like so, so beautiful. And so definitely for me was like. The I miss New York, you know, mm -hmm. like I miss being in like parts of Brooklyn or whatever right. feeling. Um, uh, but yeah, like I, I think um, this film has a, you know, a different like approach to to the, 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 the place in which it takes place that is, you know, equally kind of vibrant. And, you know, I mean, I guess I like that we get to the the. Those people, the you know, you called I forget what the homeless man's name is, but you called him like Lamont. a Greek chorus. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you have that whole like assortment of characters, like the old woman and the the shopkeeper, and who who also kind of function as like voices of the community in a way, right? Kind of commenting on the action from time to time, which I thought was a you know an interesting device. Yeah. Oh my God, Lamont! Like, seriously, y'all, Lamont, Lamont yeah. made me laugh so hard, even though because you hate I, Mayo. Oh, yes. I was like, also, I was like, like my that, Mao, thank you. Yes. That, Put mayo that, on that sandwich. <laughs> that scene. <laughs> I have a scene so similar in a script that I've been working on. I was like, well, okay then. Like, I need to completely go back and redraft this because it is like word for word. I mean, Oh my God, he killed me so much. Being like, what do I look like? The magical Negro? Like it makes time, but that male line, like you're choking me. Oh my God, you guys, listen, it's on Netflix. Check it out. I, I think people will enjoy it. Oh, before we break, I do want to say her outfit at the end was fucking dope. Like yeah. she looked yeah. so good. I loved it. I just need to say mm -hmm. that. Uh, good job, stylists. Okay, now we'll be back. Hey friends, thanks for listening to FFR. If you enjoy our weekly conversations about the intersection of feminism and pop culture, consider hopping over to patreon.com slash femfreak and joining our podcast community. You can get access to exclusive bonus episodes, join our friendly Discord server, participate in polls to help decide topics for future episodes, and more. Plus, you'll be helping us keep bringing FFR to the virtual podcast airwaves. Visit patreon.com slash femfreak today. All right, now it's time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us. Carolyn? Yeah. Was it you? I do. It was me. Cool. Yeah, I do have a freak out this week, but it's it, this is sort of one from the vault or one from the Caro archives because it's not Hell a yeah. new, it's not a new work, but I do have a reason for, <laughs> for mentioning it right now. So um, a few weeks ago, we lost the the great Christopher Plummer, who mm. was an what? actor. When? Uh, really? A few weeks ago. Yes. yes. Yeah. How did I miss that? Oh, I don't wow. know. Pop culture co-host. 
I um, fuck if I know anything. You need okay, to pay sorry. more attention in Pop Talk our, on our Slack because. Uh, <laughs> but true. I know I flood. I flood pop, like every little tidbit of pop news or ephemera I that I see. It. I'm like, oh, I that looks good. That. I'll it's, share that in Pop Talk, and it's probably like overwhelming. It's the so. only reason I know anything is happening. Okay. If Car- Carolyn's the gatekeeper to my knowledge. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I am a gate. Thank you for using that word because I am a gatekeeper. Uh, me and Mar- <laughs> me and Marty Scorsese. Our gatekeeping <laughs> yes. me- media. Um, no, but so so yeah. So we lost Christopher Plummer. Now Christopher Plummer was an actor who, you know, was so uh, ubiquitous in films that I saw like throughout my entire life. That but but for most of my life, I didn't even know his name or like. It wasn't until maybe um, he he maybe uh, that film The Insider where he played Mike Wallace from Sixty Minutes where where. And there was like buzz around him where I'm like, oh, yeah, that guy. And then, you know, but he played like the the Klingon captain in Star Trek six, you know, the one who likes Shakespeare and the original Klingon. And anyway, a really great actor um, who who will be missed. And he was active up until Knives Out. Like, I mean, you mm-hmm. know, like this was a he played like the only maybe the only halfway decent white person in that movie. So um, <laughs> but but um he won, I think, he won an Academy Award in the past decade, his only, like, Academy Award, for a performance in a film called Beginners. And Beginners is a film by a filmmaker named Mike Mills, who is not to be confused with the R.E.M. band member, Mike Mills, but, um, and Beginners is a sort of, I think, semi-autobiographical film that Mills made about his own father, because um, his own father um, sort of, uh, when his wife or M- Mike's mother died, um, when you know at an at an older age, um, Mike's dad came out as gay, as an older, like a much older, you know, gay man, and lived openly as a gay man for like the la- the latter part of his life. Um, but he had, you know, and and so the film is called Beginners because um, uh, Christopher Plummer plays this older man who. Finally, you know, in I think he's the characters like in his maybe mid 70s or something like finally has the opportunity to in a way that he doesn't feel will hurt anyone else to say like, well, you know, I I don't want to just be theoretically gay. I want to do something about it. And he starts living as a as a gay, you know, as a gay man for like the first time in his life, even though he's been gay his his whole life, of course. And um, Ewan McGregor plays his son, who um, is in his own is in his late thirties. Um, and he's a straight, you know, a straight guy, but he himself is in many ways, kind of, um, a beginner because, he, you know, he just hasn't had relationships really that have lasted or that have worked right. He hasn't found or clicked with the right person. Um, and so, you know, the film kind of positions them both as beginners and, Part of the reason why, I mean, I think it's a lovely film in its own right, but I also, so, you know, we've talked a few times on this pad, podcast, this episode, the phrase of be, women, women like hitting 40 and becoming like invisible has come up. But there are also ways in which some of us women, for whatever reason, like are never visible or never feel visible, like never have the experience or, or, or reach a certain age of, you know, I'm in my 40s, you know. And feel like, well, I haven't yet had that experience for the first time of feeling like seen and visible and desirable. Like I'm still, I'm still a beginner. And so I like it when we get narratives, you know, I think in its own weird way, San Junipero, the Black Mirror episode is another one because both characters in that are much older, even though uh, they're represented by much younger avatars. But I like it when we see films in which older people um, are have a romantic experience, like a meaningful romantic experience for like the first time in their lives, because we're so, it's so culturally like believed that everyone has in their teens or twenties or whatever, a kind of coming of age. And, you know, we all know what it is like to, to love and be loved, to have those experiences. And the reality is that we don't like, like a lot of us fall through the cracks and we don't have those experiences for and a lot of times it's because we're, we're queer or trans and we're living lives of performance that don't um, mesh up with who we really are. And then sometimes when we do live authentically, we're not like really seen for who we are. But um, 
So Beginners is just like a really sweet um, film about about you know older people, you know, in, in of different types, kind of finding um, authentic uh, ways of being and authentic modes of connection for the first time in their lives. And Christopher Plummer is wonderful in it. So, you know, um, I recommend if you haven't seen it um, and maybe want to see a great Christopher Plummer performance, um, check out Beginners. And uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Thanks, Carol. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to Feminist Frequency Radio. Join us next week when we talk about Run Lola Run, which was actually picked by our patrons. So if you want to learn more about how you can help choose our episodes, you can head over to patreon.com slash femfreak. Our show is engineered by Rob Parra. Carrie Simpson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.